we're going to switch gears a little bit here, um, and as Colin mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, pilot plan work uh, in comp um, to uh, phenotype mice, I guess, without making adult mice. Um, so Steve and I are going to be um, talking about um, a couple of connected items related to the development of and piloting of a, uh, of a pipeline to analyze haploessential genes um, that we're, we're coming across um, through the comp uh, work in IMPC. So I'm going to talk uh, mostly about the, the plans that we have in place. Um, we're right in the midst of beginning the process of testing this out. And then Steve is going to talk a little bit about his experience outside of comp actually using founder screening um, as a mechanism for phenotyping. So everything I'm going to be talking about today um, was a collaboration to get this project started amongst the three um, uh, comp consortia sites. Um, so um, this was a collaborative process to get this going. Um, so as most people in this room know, um, about 25% uh, of the IMPC targeted genes um, have been identified as being recessive lethal. Um, and we've obviously created a robust production and embryo phenotyping pipelines to capture um, the, the gene essentiality um, and the phenotypes associated with them. Um, just because for the sake of time, you know, to summarize what we've learned, a couple of key important points is that the human uh, disease genes are enriched for mouse uh, essential genes. Um, so we can see that, that essentiality human disease association. And more recently, in the submitted uh, paper from Pilar, uh, Violetta, um, Terry, and uh, Damien, that gene, the, the, these essential genes, these recessive uh, lethal essential genes, can be divided into two broad categories of cellular and developmental lethal genes, where the cellular lethal genes um, map to genes that have been deemed to be essential for um, cell fitness in the human uh, cancer cell line screens that have been performed with CRISPR-Cas9, and then developmental lethal genes that kind of fall without, outside that category really don't map to cellular essentiality and are important for uh, more organismal level uh, developmental functions. What we are, however, not capturing is another uh, subset of genes that are dominant lethal haploessential genes. So in humans, it's estimated that up to 3,000 genes cannot tolerate loss of function of one of the two alleles, which we all know is haploinsufficiency. And this can be categorized as those that are either comp uh, compromised viability, so they're embryonic lethal in humans, or cause profound loss of fitness, so disease-causing uh, uh, mutations. So there are hundreds um, of de novo uh, rare dominant uh, disease, uh, g uh, disease sy and syndromes that have been identified that are caused by um, loss of function of one allele um, in humans. And there is emerging evidence of contribution of these types of mutations to uh, miscarriages associated with euploid pregnancies. So they actually represent very important uh, types of mutations that um, we should be collecting phenotypic information on. So as with the human disease um, uh, uh, recessive lethal associa uh, association we've seen in the mice, we've hypothesized that dominant lethal haploessential genes in mice will also be enriched for, in this case, human haploinsufficient genes. So in this case, obviously, those genes that are also lethal in humans, and also those um, uh, genes for which a loss of one allele causes severe disease phenotype where we cannot, um, for our best, best uh, case scenario, cannot get these mice to go beyond on um, the founder stage at, at latest. Um, so currently, our IMPC pipelines are not designed to produce or phenotype haploessential genes because we can't propagate this line forward. Either we can't make a founder or the founder can't breed um, or the founder dies. So we've seen this evidence of this within our production information. So this has really been an interesting project to develop because it really has bridged the gap of problems that we've seen in production and actually having to, uh, to devise mechanisms for phenotyping these, these types of things. So the embryo people have had to learn some production things, and production people like me have had to learn way too much about embryogenesis. Um, so, um, yeah, scary for me. Um, so this is one of the one of the earliest examples of seeing this. Um, this is uh, data from Laurel in our CRISPR-Cas9 production paper, and all the data that I'm going to be talking about will actually be from CRISPR-Cas9 work. Um, the ESL work is a little bit trickier because we have a lot of other technical issues running around, like germ, uh, the uh, germline transmission rate from the ESL library itself, um, and appropriate targeting of the alleles. So we've kind of scrubbed that data out looking at this type of uh, analysis. So the, the genes that we've attempted have been, we broke down into what we refer to as non-essential genes and essential genes. So this is basically using the data um, from um, the 
paper current land review from Pilar and Violetta, um, where they actually use some um, algorithms to establish and identify genes that are, that are very likely to be um, human cell essential, um, the human orthologs, uh, or non-cell uh, cell essential. And we divided our, our, our attempts into those two categories. And there's two pieces of information here. One is the scatter plot and the, and the box plot that goes along with it that shows founder rate. And the other are these two um, red lines shown here, which is the germline transmission rate of these particular classes of genes. And you can see that in the, these, these mouse orthologs to human uh, cell essential genes that we, one, see a very uh, dramatic reduction in founder production rate um, in general, and also germline transmission rate. So there's something going on here that is, that is making it much, more in, uh, uh, much less uh, efficient in generating these, these lines for essential genes. One could say, well, maybe they're homozygous lethal, and that we're just creating founders that have both copies deleted. Um, as most of you know, the mechanism that we use to generate knockout alleles for the comp project is actually based on some flavor of an exon deletion involving at least two guides um, and to generate these knockout alleles. And we know from our data that in general, our founder animals are typically heterozygous and are often mosaic. So although they could be in some cases that we are just really editing at very high efficiency and creating homozygous um, animals that are dying on us, or there's actually some haploessentiality going on within the data. So if we actually categorize what the germline transmission failures kind of fall into as far as what we see and when we can't actually generate a line, um, the first is that we don't produce a fa uh, a founders at all. And like I said, that could be due to a couple of things, either technical issues where our guides are not cutting, um, or we could actually be over-editing, we're generating these homozygous knockouts. Also, the possibility is that we are getting hap we are seeing haploessentiality from the genes, so we're not able to produce the founders, um, and uh, associated with that are X-linked lethal or disease-associated genes um, where we're also not being able to produce founders. So it's a flavor of, I guess, haploessentiality. Um, the founders can die before breeding. Of course, that could be due to bad luck. Also, could be due to haploessentiality or mosaicism in the founder animals that, uh, of um, haploessential genes for the knockout, um, that allowing them to survive for some period of time. Um, the, this is an interesting category, and is really for us where we started thinking about haploessentiality is this founders produce and transmit only wild type offspring. So again, this could be something as simple as a genotyping error, but, um, or it could also be mosaic, mosaicism for a gene uh, essential for germ cell development. But this also could indicate mosaicism for a haploessential gene that allowed the founder to survive, but the offspring who are obligate heterozygotes are not able to survive, leading to only wild type offspring. And then obviously founders do not produce offspring at all. Again, this could just be the, the, the process that we have sometimes hap happens when animals just won't breed. Um, or in this particular case, we could be dealing with haploinsufficiency for a, um, a reproductive function type of a gene. Um, although we are mostly focusing on lethality, this is also an interesting class of genes um, that we can kind of start working on capturing. Um, however, from um, the data that I've seen, this actually represents a very small amount of the um, issues we have with germline transmission. It's these other four, three categories that are the main problem. So at Baylor, one of the things that we saw that actually got us thinking about this, um, especially because of the d potential disease association between essentiality um, and human diseases, um, is our data from, as we've talked about, these human uh, discovery partner um, that, that we have. Um, and we started looking at, and a lot of the sites have seen this as well, as when we started trying to generate knockout mice or knockout lines for genes that have been nominated by our discovery partners, we actually started to observe um, more of an issue of getting germline transmission. Um, so these are the, some of the discovery groups that we work with at Baylor, some of them through Comp in general, some of them, that's the specific sites at Baylor. And this is our data on germline transmission for what we call non-discovery partner um, genes and those nominated by our discovery partners that are more disease associated. And you can see that we actually get a substantial drop off from 74% germline transmission to 65% germline transmission of our lines, which is statistically significant, which again is suggesting that there is some disease association there. So if we actually started to ask whether or not there was evidence for hap um, haploessentiality and whether or not there was constraints on, on loss of function of these genes um, within the genome, we actually went back and uh, took our data, our, our assigned genes in total. So all the genes that we've assigned, either we've started production, the awaiting production, just basically what our gene lists are in total, and looked at what the, uh, the PLI score, so the probability of being loss of function and tolerance is for those that are nominated by discovery partners that are likely disease associated in our general cast of genes. 
And we can see that we do get a, a statistically significant increase in the number of um, genes that have very high PLI scores, so likely, um, highly likely to be intolerant to loss of function. And on the right is just shown a distribution of these. So we can see that in these, this high, high likelihood uh, intolerance group, we do see this, this increase. We also took a look at this from the standpoint of just looking at our germline transmission success versus failure risk in, independent of a dis disease partner association. And again, what we saw is for those lines that we actually have um, no germline transmission, we see an enrichment for an increase in uh, 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 PLI scores that are indicative of restraint on, uh, constraint on loss of function. And again, if you look at this group of genes that fall in the, the very high likelihood of intolerance, we see this pretty dramatic increase um, within that gene list. So we actually think this is, again, looking at the Baylor data that we see evidence for, um, for, for these genes that have constraint on loss of function. So if we go to the comp level um, and look at two different particular paradigms on this, one is do we produce founders or not, which is a category of germline transmission success, and then overall germline transmission success based on all of those four categories, we again see the same trends where for those that do, we are unable to produce any founders, we have a higher um, average PLI score. And for those that we do not see germline transmission, we see a higher PLI score, which again is indicative that we are potentially capturing in our data set um, and, and lists genes that are, um, that are haploessential. So from that preliminary data, we, um, and because we do not have a way of otherwise phenotyping these lines, um, we submitted a, um, a supplement request to actually develop an, a pipeline to assess for these. So the overarching goal of these supplements at the three sites is to develop a robust yet rapid null phenotyping pipeline to characterize dominant and recessive lethal genes. I'm framing this around the importance of using this pipeline to capture hapless essential dominant lethal genes that otherwise can't be phenotyped, but this pipeline also could potentially be used for those that we have bioinformatic information of even recessive lethality and just going to a screen that does not require generation of a line. So the idea of this line is to um, develop a list of genes um, that we prioritize that are likely to be haplo um, essential or potentially um, recessive lethal. Um, and to um, develop um, founder, founder animal-based screening plat uh, platforms that can look for pre-implantation lethality phenotypes, which we believe probably are going to be more tightly associated with human cell, uh, cell level essential uh, genes, and also founder screening uh, platforms that will allow us to look for post-implantation implantation lethality. So again, those more likely to be de involved with developmental lethal genes um, that are involved in organogenesis patterning and other types of things like that. So as, as usual, all three sites are, have a framework of the same type of, um, of aims to do this um, with slightly different flavors to the, to the, um, to the aims. Um, so these are the three Baylor aims. is one to, um, to generate the, the, and to uh, list of prioritized genes to look at, um, develop a platform for pre-implantation phenotyping. So, and, and I'll show examples of this where we're actually going to be using an embryo scope to look at the development from, from the two cell to the blastocyst stage for um, developmental defects, um, an annotation of the imaging, and, uh, and then a quantitative genotyping, and then post-implantation implantation phenotyping where we will um, introduce the CRISPR reagents, generate the embryos and transfer them, and then directly at embryonic day nine and a half look for developmental abnormalities. So again, this is all founder-based phenotyping. And all the three sites have some fl flavor of this, which I'll, and I'll show their examples as well. Um, so just as an example of what we're doing, um, this is the embryoscope that we will hopefully be showing up in the next couple of weeks um, that will allow um, live, live imaging of cultured embryos. Um, this will allow us to do 240 embryos in one go. Um, and as you can see on the, the video that's being shown on the right, that we can get some pretty well, good detailed imaging of the um, embryos as they develop from the, the, in this case, a single cell stage to the, um, to the blastocyst stage. Um, so we're going to be looking for developmental milestones um, such as cleavage timing, um, uh, cavitation, and, and other types of uh, phenotypic uh, events to see if we have association with developmental abnormalities. These will have to be pulled for genotyping, which is a, um, an issue that we'll talk about in a bit. So the um, E9.5 pipeline will take advantage of the existing embryo screening pipelines that we have in place at all three comp sites. This is just the version of the, of the Baylor ver, um, uh, workflow. Um, everyone's targeting embryonic day 9.5 to look for abnormalities. I think all sites have in mind that if we don't see defects at embryonic day 9.5, we might, if we have time and money, walk it further down the line and see where we can find developmental abnormalities. 
Um, this is the, um, the, the aims and workflow for DTCC. Um, so this is uh, work being done at UC Davis and TCP. Again, they have the same type of scheme, identifying genes, screening for pre-implantation embryonic lethality. Those that they do not see embryonic lethality at those time points move on to post-implantation screening, such as, as, as I gave an example, E9 and a half. Um, DTCC is looking at also uh, doing this at different genetic, modif uh, genetic backgrounds to look at modifier mutations that might, or modifiers in the genome that might influence um, timing of, of lethality or lethality at all. And then finally, TCP will be doing tetraploid complementation assays for some of these lines that, that have um, later developmental abnormalities to see if they can rescue embryonic tissues, uh, they can rescue embryonic lethality by complementing the embryos with extra embryonic cells that are derived from wild type um, embryos. So again, they're looking for extra embryonic placental defects that might lead to lethality. Uh, the Jackson Lab is also doing this. Um, they have a slightly different AIM-1 where they're going to be using ES cell-based screening um, in different uh, genetic backgrounds of ES cells um, to identify cells that, that are, or genes that are more on the, um, the cellular level essential, um, kind of like the, cell, the human cell-based screens. Their AIM-2 involves both looking at the blastocyst stage and the embryonic day nine and a half stage like the other sites. And again, they'll also be looking at genetic context and their AIM-3 about, again, looking for genetic models modifiers that might influence either the phenotypes that are observed or the stages of embryonic lethality. So just as kind of the nuts, some nuts and bolts about what we're working on right now as we're starting to get these pipelines going. Um, so the first part was actually to work on a target gene list for, hapo, for the haploessential pipeline. And thankfully, we've um, started to work together on developing a unified list for us to all work from. Um, so the first goal um, was to identify genes with null allele GLT failure across the, um, across the IMPC. Um, so we focused on the ones from the CRISPR-Cas9 work and on genes that had one-to-one -one mapping to um, a human ortholog. Um, we developed gene, we looked for um, other annotations um, within these sets, um, work that was done with uh, PILAR to um, pull in some evidence from the human orthologs for likelihood of um, constraint on loss of function. This includes PLI scores, um, other mechanisms of prediction of um, autosomal dominant or recessive loss of function, um, phenotypes, um, disease associations for, from like OMIM, um, human cell essential screening um, data, and also the studies in human populations on tolerance of, of uh, knockouts or complete loss of function. So from this, we were able to uh, currently devise a list of 426 uh, genes that have had germline transmission failure um, when we attempted null alleles. 94 of those actually fall within um, the category of human cell essential. Um, so likely to have early, very early embryonic uh, phenotypes, and 302 of those um, fall within the um, human cell non-essential category that was developed um, in Pilar and uh, Violetta's paper. Um, and in this case, 26 are X-linked genes um, were on the list, and this pretty much represents, um, if you do the math, the a normal distribution of, of X-linked genes within the genome. So we are not necessarily seeing an enrichment for X-linked genes. Um, so one of the interesting things that I did was I was actually curious about if we can, because this was done in um, uh, Pilar and Violetta's paper, looking at category, categories of genes and gene function in our list. So I ran the entire list. I did not filter it based on likelihood of um, loss, of, loss of function and tolerance to just see what types of gene categories we had involved. And we actually observed something quite striking. Um, we actually get quite a strong enrichment for RNA, bi what I call RNA biology. So mRNA processing, RNA splicing, translation, ribosome uh, uh, assembly, um, and splicing. I think I was on there twice. Um, so this is um, from Go Biological Processes and CAG Pathways. Um, and interestingly, and I don't have this, I, if you separate the data out, most of these are actually associated with the cell essential genes. Um, the ones associated more with, um, with proteasome, oxidative phosphorylation, metabolism, um, and transport are more associated with the genes that are fall within the non-essential category. So there might be some um, stories there, but and it's actually interesting to think from an evolutionary standpoint why we'd have such an intolerance to loss of function within a, a category of genes involved in RNA biology. So um, just as an example of what we're working with in this list, this is um, data from uh, Steve Murray um, to actually try to, as a representation of filtering down this list to the most likely candidates to um, enter into 
our phenotype screening. Um, so the first, um, he started with this list that I talked about, the, these GLT fails, and went through process of filtering out of them, high PLI scores, domino prediction of likely or very likely um, uh, dominant um, uh, effects on, um, on function. Um, cell essentiality status, he considered both because we're interested in both cellular and developmental level um, essentiality. Um, and then one of the filters that he added on was whether or not there's an existing mouse knockout, which makes sense since we're interested in haploessential genes. And if a knockout exists already, it's probably not one of those. And then he, he actually did this filtering for his, the sets of genes that have been worked on at JAX. And this is kind of the filtering down that he got for on um, the JAK specific genes, um, where you can see that as you start building these filters in, um, we actually start whittling down this gene list to a smaller number of genes. So we have a, a handful of genes at each site that fall within these essential and non-essential categories that are deemed to be likely um, uh, have high constraint on, on um, uh, essentiality um, that we're working on. The list is unfortunately not as probably long as we want it to be. Um, so we're starting to think about how we want to annotate a list moving forward. Um, so the first thing is, as we start thinking about this, is incorporating existing uh, other existing data, such as the mouse knockout data that, that from MGI that, that Steve worked with, maybe also starting to look at the IMPC ESL library for genes that we were not able to target, um, and also maybe looking in the ENU um, library and the libraries of, uh, of ENU screens that have been done, whether or not there's genes that seem to be intoler intolerant to um, ENU mutagenesis. Uh, integrating uh, embryo gene, uh, embryonic gene expression profiles to start looking at genes that might be important at particular time points, and considering other metrics of human intolerance to loss of function that exist in, in data. And really what we want to do is to take this and take these other filters and add them in so we can move beyond the genes that we know already have germline transmission failure and can actually explore the entire genome using this type of information to narrow down to those that are likely to be um, haploessential or um, haploinsufficient, at least for, for humans. And we're really um, hoping to generate a target list of 200 genes to start with. Um, so the last thing that I'll, um, I'll just talk about briefly is um, the actual approach to making the null alleles. And the reason I bring this up is that we are planning on deviating from the normal IMPC comp allele structure. Um, so I wanted to just mention this, and this can be a point of discussion and go over why we decided to do this. Um, so as I've stated, and most people here know, is we do a, an exon deletion approach to generate the knockout alleles. Um, for the haploessential screen, we're actually going to uh, and have agreed to move towards a um, indel approach to generate the knockout alleles. The primary reasons for this are shown here. Um, so first, um, we had some concerns about the, the efficiency of generating null alleles by introducing the two guides what, or four guides to, gen uh, to generate an exon deletion. While that is sufficient enough for us to generate enough founders to, to move a line forward, when we're going to be screening individual embryos, we wanted to maximize our mutagenic uh, capacity in these so we had enough animal embryos to screen. Um, the ease of detecting technical failures, so there will be in-frame deletions that will be created from this, some of which may not be pathogenic. Um, so if we see them in otherwise normal embryos, we know that one, our guides worked. It was not a technical issue. Without that information being there, it would be very hard to tell if we were just not seeing editing at all or if it was actually um, uh, uh, lethal at some point. Um, and then uh, compatibility with different quantitative genotyping approaches, um, which basically we only need to do one PCR assay in this case to, to, or, or to, as a basis for identifying all these events. The, uh, one, one of the cons to taking on this approach is understanding the phenotypes associated with in-frame indels. While some of them might not be pathogenic, some of them might be, they might have a different phenotypic spectrum from loss of function alleles, so that is a complication in understanding what those mean if we see phenotypes. Um, and these are the, the basic uh, allele quantification mechanisms that we're using. I know Steve will talk a little bit about some of these in his presentation, um, just using um, deconvolution of Sanger sequencing data or doing a multiplex targeted deep sequencing approach to um, get an understanding of this. Because really, in the end, what we need to know is when we start screening for these phenotypes is whether or not we're having an issue with mosaicism or a disease spectrum or phenotype spectrum associated with mosaicism in these embryos. So um, just a list of challenges, um, the last uh, set of slides before the summary. Um, I know Steve's going to talk about this in some level in his, in his presentation as well. There are going to be challenges for uh, genotyping and allele quantification um, based on the amount of material we'll have and whether or not we need to consider regional mosaicism, which I know Steve will talk about. There's phenotyping considerations to still take, um, that we still need to consider, um, including controlling um, the, the frequency and the types of phenotypes we just see with embryo manipulation. 
um, understanding the phenotypic impact of the in-frame deletions, um, mosaicism and the spectrum of phenotypes, and then finally sample size, which we really need to get a more empirical information about our editing frequency to understand how many embryos we'll actually have to look at. And then finally coordinating with uh, the DCC about uh, data collection and the ins and outs of, the, of actually having to annotate individual embryos that will have different genotypes and potentially different phenotypes. So to just summarize, um, up to 15% of human genes may not be tolerant uh, to loss of one or two alleles. Our existing pipelines really can't capture that, and we're really hoping to use this founder-based uh, CRISPR-generated null allele screening platform of pre- and post-implantation embryos to start annotating phenotype, phenotypic information on these genes that might have very important uh, human disease correlations with them. Um, there's challenges that we still need to address with genotyping and phenotyping during the pilot. And then um, I've added a question mark under, under Lydia's uh, um, comment on this, is maybe that this, these are the set of genes that we really do need to consider um, conditional allele production. If we're really going to think about that, I know Neil's not here, he would probably love this, but there, this is one set of genes that we should maybe consider that, that type of approach. So, um, and then just to thank um, the three comp sites that have contributed their slides and then some uh, individuals that actually helped with the data analysis parts of this. Um, so I think it might be best for Collins up to you really if you want to wait until after Steve to do a discussion on this and questions. So this just actually brings in Jason as well, is in terms of this gene list and what might be haploessential, I'm wondering if the duplicated regions in the HAP1 cells that you know of might be enriched for haploessential because the reason they're duplicated is they need two copies or something like that. And I'm just wondering if maybe we should look, if, if you know what those genes are by and large, if maybe that might provide some additional information. I mean, obviously there's a difference between organism haploessential and cell level haploessential, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering if that might give us some ideas or, or some pointers. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the interesting thing is there's only two regions that are duplicated in the HAP1 cells, and they've, been, they've actually been shuffled out. But every time we make a clonal knockout of a given gene and then amplify that clone out, and have multiple different clones. This is where it starts getting more interesting because we find different regions of the genome that seem to be amplified or duplicated. Um, and we don't know whether or not it's because the query that we're going after when you knock it out is selecting for that. And that's what we're trying to find. Uh, so it's a good question. I'm not sure there's a systematic and easy way to figure it out though. Yeah. Yeah, so my, uh, my question was on the, actually relates to Jesse's uh, presentation earlier, and that is, um, do we need to consider the outgrowth assay yeah. since we know now that we can't rely strictly yeah. on visual assay? Yeah, and I, I meant to mention that at the end of the, going over the three workflows. I, I would say yes, that we do need to explore that, because um, I think we're, I'm more, what I'm more worried about is just the frequency at which that, that category in general was a very large, like 50, 15, 20% range category. Yeah, I think it's something that we're definitely gonna have to consider doing, because I think we're, we've got a hole there, um, and, that, and I 100% agree with you on that. So that's something we need to consider. Actually, unrelated comment, um, but certainly we can talk about that. Uh, I was thinking, if you're gonna go through this effort, you wanna make sure you have the right genes, obviously. Uh, make a few conditionals, make sure they are. Lethal mm -hmm. and, or even quicker and a little dirtier, is do some RNAi in embryos. Make sure the null phenotype is lethal. Yeah. If it's not, that would tell you these aren't haploinsufficient genes, right? I don't know if RNAi would be quicker than what we're doing with CRISPR, but it might be. Well, it would, it would probably correct the maternal. Yes. And you can could, easily uh, test to make sure it's working. Sure. Right. Yeah. To make sure you have yeah, lethal the, phenotype. Yeah. The time I, I would I, I would agree with you that doing conditionals first might be a way to get to do that, but the time frame that we have to deal with with the supplement kind of makes that a not a non non starter on this at this point. But in the future, if we're this is something that we continue to explore, that's something that we could do. But. Are we going to uh, are, are, before we leave the meeting? Are we going to finalize the list for the pilot? I'm sorry. What was that before we leave the meeting? 
Well, I mean, we're all right here. Can't we just decide on the list before we leave? I, I think we, uh, right now, I think we have a, a working list, at least from, from my view. I mean, the, thing, the, th the piece that we do not have in the existing working list is what Steve did, which is the, the annotation of um, known MGI across the entire list. That's something that we've been doing manually for ourselves, but I think the, the kind of the metrics that Steve has on his slide are the ones that, that we've been going with um, and have provided a significant number of genes that we can definitely get this started. Um, so high PLI, uh, domino prediction of, of dominant mode of inheritance, both cell essential and non-essential than existing mount. I think that these can be enough to get us to a starting list. Yep. So I think the idea was to repeat that genome wide, not just focus on our production failures, which I think was sort of made a lot of sense. But you know, we I think to get more genes that are similarly constrained in the genome and, and likely to be uh, in that category, I think it would be valuable to sort of repeat the analysis in the broader set which uh, Pilar and Violetta provided that full list, so now we can mine that and compare it to mm -hmm. MGI. Yep. So I think the planes are all there. It's just a matter of gen regenerating that, that new list. So, and Pilar's in here someplace, I believe. She was here hiding. Oh, there she is. She's hiding in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, we, we've had those conversations have happened, so we should be able to. We have, I think, the plan's in place. So. All right. Yep. Good. Go ahead. Don't have to escape out. Yeah. 